Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce you or to welcome you to the next evening of our lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, that is hosted by, in cooperation by the Alexander from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and the German Federal Agency for Civic Education. With this lecture series, we are trying to grasp the ongoing digital transformations and try to make sense of how we can discuss, interpret, and see the changes. And are there for this, inviting prominent speakers from Europe to present their thoughts, their ideas, their analysis. And turn down my own phone, I'm very sorry for that. Um, just a second. Yes, and are trying to, to figure out a European perspective on digital transformations. So, uh, welcome to you. This, tonight, we are going to have a lecture by Nick Coldry, whom I'm especially welcome here, right on time. And he's going to be properly, properly introduced by our moderator, Tobi Müller. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha Shire, from um, the Federal Agency for Civic Education for having me. Thank you, Jeanette Hoffmann from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. Before I introduce you a little bit more to our guest tonight, let me just point really quickly to the structure of the evening. I see many familiar faces. Uh, many of you probably know uh, how this will and roll. So there's going to be in a minute the lecture of our prominent guest tonight. Afterwards, maybe for about 20 minutes, we'll have a conversation. The two of us here on stage, then it's your turn. There's going to be one or two microphones in the audience. There's also a sort of invisible Twitter wall, hashtag digital society. You can see it here uh, on stage where you can um, ask questions. So maybe after 10 minutes into uh, the audience discussion, we'll ask what's going on on Twitter. And we're also being filmed tonight. There's two cameras, so if you oppose to that, well, let's not get into that. That's Nick's topic uh, of tonight, I guess. He'll tell you more about that. Our guest today from London is here to teach us, among other things, something that is rooted in England, so to say, by way of the city of Trier, Germany, I might add. We do not have the exiled Karl Marx with us tonight, but a scholar of media and social theory that draws from Marx the notion that history is man-made, that capital works through social forces, and nothing ever was natural without alternative, that is, which also means nothing ever will be without alternative. This notion may be very basic, I know, but it, I think it plays a central role in this lecture tonight, in that it looks awry at things many of us think of being natural. For example, data harvesting in the private sector. Let me quote from the website of our distinguished guest, um, very excellent uh, website, I think, by the way, I quote, throughout my career, I have tried to confront a basic paradox that information and communication technologies, because they present us with a reality every day, can easily come to seem like a second nature. As a result, what should always be contestable can end up seeming beyond challenge, a structure of power that is too hard to move or break through." End quote. This certainly rings a bell when we think of the topics this series has covered, the shift in what we mean by saying democracy and the public sphere under digital capitalism, artificial intelligence, predictive algorithms, the rise of the smart city, and as an undercurrent, uh, surveillance. Tonight we can add to the list dataism or datification as colonialism. The proper title of the lecture, you can probably read it behind me, Colonized by Data, the Hollowing Out of Digital Society. Our guest is Professor of Media, Communications, and Social Theory at the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE. He's a sociologist of media and culture who has also written widely on the ethics and philosophical implications of media. His most recent article is called Deconstructing Datification's Brave New World with Yun with Yun. 
Yun Yu uh, of LSE also, which draws on their recent Price of Connection funded research project. His last book, The Mediated Construction of Reality with Andreas Hepp, won the German Communication Association's biannual theory prize. He's the author or editor of 12 books in more than 100 journals and book chapters, including Media Society World, Social Theory and Digital Media Practice in 2012, Why Voice Matters in 2010, Media Rituals, A Critical Approach, and Insight Culture. Tonight's topic is also kind of a preview of his uh, next book, which he co-authors with uh, Ulysses Mejias of New York, and which will be out in spring or summer next year at Stanford University Press. The Costs of Connection, it is called, How Data is Colonizing Human Life and Appropriating It for Capitalism. Now the stage is yours. Please, a very warm welcome to Nick Coldry. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Toby. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be speaking in this wonderful lecture series. Something big is going on with data. Data is not just big in terms of volume, as reflected in the phrase big data. Something transformative is happening with data. Now, we've known this since at least the revelations of Edward Snowden in summer 2013. The real story of those revelations was not the one emphasized in the media about the surveillance by NSA and GCHQ of ordinary and sometimes, as in the case of uh, President Merkel, less ordinary citizens. The real story was how much data corporations were already collecting from us from which governments simply sought to benefit, a story about the public-private surveillance partnership, as US security expert Bruce Schneier calls it. And in this lecture, I want to look deeper into what's going on with data, and I'll be drawing on my forthcoming book with the Mexican-US scholar Ulysses Mejias called The Costs of Connection, which comes out next year but is already available for order if this lecture doesn't uh, put you off from ordering it. That's the end of the marketing, I promise. Now the core point of our book is that what's happening today in digital societies where data harvesting seems such a natural, such a basic feature of everyday life is not just a development or even a new phase of capitalism, as many writers have claimed, it's something even bigger it's a genuinely new phase of colonialism that will, in time, provide the fuel for a later stage of capitalism whose full shape we cannot predict yet. And this is what we start to see if we shift the time scale from the past 30 to 40 years, in which, for sure, capitalism has become embedded into ever more sectors of daily life, to the past 500 years over which the relations of capitalism to colonialism have played out. We're thinking about colonialism here in terms of its fundamental historical function, as the appropriation of resources on a vast scale. In 1500, and for the next 400 years, it was territory that was acquired. It was the resources of the land and, of course, the bodies for a long time those of slaves, needed to extract value from those resources. Today, the resources being appropriated are us. Human life in all its depth extracted as value through the medium of data. This possibility that we're entering a genuinely new phase of colonialism where human beings are the target is, as the cliche goes, the bad news. But there's also some good news. First, that this cycle of colonialism is only just starting. By just, I mean in the past 20 years. Second, we have today a memory of what historic colonialism did and how over centuries it fueled industrial 
capitalism. And in the West, we would do well to listen to those whose memory of colonialism's impact is much sharper than ours. And third, we certainly know what capitalism is, having lived much or all of our lives under it. Remember that the initial victims of historic colonialism did not have those last two advantages. To give you a sense of what we might gain by interpreting our present relations with data on this longer time scale, let's think back to earlier this year and another key moment in the collective realization that something big is going on with data. And I mean the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal which broke in mid-March 2018. This scandal prompted many to check what data was being routinely collected from and about them via platforms such as Facebook, via search engines such as Google. Many of them were shocked, though many already knew this. As the scandal heightened, the Edward Snowden of this moment, Christopher Wiley, a former employee of Cambridge Analytica, commented on Twitter about Cambridge Analytica's plans for expanding its operations to India. This is what modern colonialism looks like, he wrote. Now you might say, hang on, that's just too easy. Yes, the legacy of older colonialism lives on, we all know it, in the geography of global capitalism, in the dominant power to this day of American culture, in the racial divides in the US, Brazil, and many other countries, in the dynamics of migration. Almost every form of power imbalance today can in some way, of course, be related back to the legacy of historic colonialism, and so has been called neo-colonial by one critic or another. And perhaps the sort of power that Facebook has sought to exercise in Africa through its Facebook Free Basics platform is best understood as a neo-colonial move, benefiting from the historic asymmetry between Africa and American capital. But you would say. That of itself doesn't mean that what is going on today is a new type of colonialism. And you would be right. It is too easy to use the word colonialism as a metaphor, including in relation to all things digital. But Ulysses and I, when we talk about data colonialism, we do not mean it as a metaphor. We are claiming instead that what is going on with data today represents potentially as far-reaching an appropriation of resources as the conquest of gold and territory in historic colonialism, a land grab in digital territory that is likely to have as far-reaching implications as historical colonialism did, a colonial reality, not a metaphor, which we are living and which, to which we need to wake up. Think of the terms of service to which we sign up every time we install an app, every time we join a platform. That's my phone, by the way. In normal times, I don't mean the few days after the Cambridge Analytical scandal broke. In normal times, no one reads the terms. We just click accept, because we want to get on and use the app or the platform. Sometimes our acceptance is just assumed, no questions asked though the GDPR has tried to disrupt that assumption. Sometimes our employer encourages us to use a Fitbit to monitor our health, which requires us to accept Fitbit's terms and conditions, whether we like them or not. Or we may be required to accept terms and conditions of data extraction by an insurer or by the supplier of a smart appliance in our home. But by that act of acceptance, actual or implied, we enter into a whole set of what Ulysses and I call data relations that unfold in ways we understand only very partly. It sometimes seems a mystery how we can accept so much with so little resistance. But let's think historically through a colonial lens. Let's think back to a document used in the early days of the Spanish conquest of Latin America called the requerimiento, or demand. Almost exactly 500 years ago, the document was drafted in 1513 at the Spanish court. Conquistadors would ride up to a mile or two outside a village whose gold they wanted 
and read out this document in the middle of the night in Spanish, a language they knew the locals did not understand. Here's a little of it. But if you do not submit, I accept, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highnesses. We shall take away your goods and shall do you all the mischief and damage that we can. The next morning, they will ride into the village and take the gold that they wanted using whatever violence they needed to do so and usually more. Now, you'll notice immediately a difference, that we really do click accept. And so no violence is needed to take our gold as we use the platform or app whose terms appear to us. I'll come back to why that is in a moment. But first, let's try to map more precisely the key features of historic colonialism onto data colonialism today. The fundamental moves and historic function of original colonialism can be understood in terms of four levels. The appropriation of resource, the creation of new social relations to stabilize that appropriation, the extreme concentration of wealth that flowed from that appropriation, and finally the ideologies that were used to tell a different story of what was going on, most notoriously the ideology of civilization. And we see exactly these same four levels at work with data colonialism. First, there is the appropriation of resources, I've said. Human life itself, human experience and action become a direct input to capital. This is often told to us as a cliche, the idea that it's just worthless human exhaust that is taken, something just naturally there anyway for the taking which conveniently forgets all the mechanisms that are needed to gather, format, extract, and process this supposedly natural resource. Second, social relations are being colonized by data processes, as all social relations increasingly take the form of data relations that maximize data extraction for value. Third, the economic value that's extracted is hugely concentrated in the vast wealth of new colonial corporations, what Ulysses and I call the social quantification sector. Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on. And finally, there are new colonial ideologies that seek to disguise what is going on. Not the idea of civilization exactly yet, but the idea that we must always stay connected that everything must be put into data form so that, for example, we can get more personalized messages and products. And the idea that all of this, including the tracking, is somehow inevitable. So we can see all four dimensions of historic colonialism at work in our life with data today. But there's one crucial difference. Unlike in 1500, when colonialism emerged without the background of two or three centuries of capitalism, today's new colonialism builds on top of the already existing social order of capitalism, which is why it does not generally need violence to be effective. How should we think about this emerging social order? Karl Marx showed that industrial capitalism social order was based on labor relations and our deep relations to commodities which make our labor relations seem natural. But Marx was such a remarkable social theorist that if we interpret him right, we can see that he allowed for another possibility, that capitalism social order might at some time in the future be built on other forms of abstraction than labor relations. Perhaps these same data relations that, as I just noted, we already enter into every day of our lives, a habit that is becoming so regular that it doesn't seem like appropriation much of the time, just convenience. Perhaps then the most important thing going on with data today, the heart of data colonialism, is something so big that it almost escapes us. Perhaps it is the new corporate strategy 
the new corporate dream you can hear from every boardroom in most countries that Ulysses and I believe underlies most of the details of datafication. The dream of annexing to capital every point in space and time, of cloning social relations on digital platforms and elsewhere so that this annexation to capital seems just natural. And through this, building a social order that capitalizes human life without any possible limit. The annexation of human life then, our lives, by to the forces of capital, a land grab without precedent in human history. An annexation that to be effective does not need the violence that prized the gold from Latin America because a vast and all-encompassing network of social relations is already in place on the foundations of which new forms of data relation can be built, provided we agree. And yes, we are used to the idea that there is no alternative to capitalism in general. But the key question is, is there an alternative to capitalism of this datafied sort? Let's remember that until 20 years ago or so, there was. We were living it. So to make these general remarks a little more concrete, I want, for the rest of my lecture, to focus on one of the key domains where data colonialism is being worked out, the social world. Marx, again, made very clear that capital does not just succeed by being imposed upon the world, it works through social relations, such as our relations to the commodity, what he famously called the commodity fetish, and via the social order built through those relations. Karl Polanyi, the economic historian, showed how the emergence of industrial capitalism in the 18th and 19th centuries was not possible without a profound change in the social fabric. Or as he put it vividly, a market economy can only exist in a market society, which must literally be created through highly artificial stimulants administered to the body social. And this happened, Polanyi argued, through a huge institutional reorganization in the 19th and 20, early 20th centuries of the areas of work, land, and finance which over time turned almost all transactions into money transactions. And gradually over time as well, there emerged a counter movement, which introduced social reforms to make the cruel order of industrial capitalism a little more human. Today with data, we're in the middle of just the first stage of a parallel process. The counter movement has not yet happened. We're already making ever more transactions into data transactions, that is, transactions configured so as to optimize the extraction of economic value through data. The basic data relations I mentioned earlier are just the simplest form of this. And these new forms of social relation can be introduced without so far much resistance, not just, as I said, because they build on the discipline that capitalism already requires of us, but also because of a change in how we know and understand the social world, the world made up of our relations to each other. For there is a second truly unprecedented thing about what's happening with data, and it relates to knowledge. Think about it. In all previous eras, knowledge, the tools through which we know the world around us, while it might have economic value, was in principle separate from economic value. But now, as countless corporations and institutions of big data are telling us, a new form of social knowledge, a new form of human knowledge even, will be made up of the very same stuff from which capitalism also makes economic value, data. The data that we give up as we enter into data relations. And if this transformation proceeds to its conclusion, which may take a few years, knowledge and economic value, society and market will become fused so that strategies for extracting economic profit can be presented without dishonesty as simply proposals to expand knowledge. 
Let's look at this in more detail. It's always hard to get into view the wider processes through which social knowledge is produced. A special difficulty, though, today is that we're still living with the legacy of an older vision of how to produce social knowledge, forged in the 19th century, partly in response to the horrors of early capitalism. This old model of social knowledge was based in the collection of public statistics, gathered generally by nation states through survey questions, answered by human beings, and interpreted by human beings. And when this emerged in the 19th century as the new model for understanding the social world, perhaps for the first time discovering the social world, this use of statistics was highly controversial. As a model of social knowledge, however, it had the following features, which, we, as we shall see, are not shared by big data. First, it was publicly funded and collected. In most countries, through the census, though I realize that that was a little more controversial in Germany. Secondly, it was publicly analyzed and put to use by governments and by civil society organizations that wanted social reform. This, for example, was how, by statistical analysis, we gained our understanding of poverty as a socially caused phenomenon, rather than, for example, as a terrible affliction somehow accidentally caused by God, to which charity was the answer. Thirdly, this knowledge was publicly debated. Even Charles Dickens entered the debate about whether statistical predictions prove that human beings have free will or not. And it was more or less publicly accountable and contested. Now, I would not suggest for one moment that the governments of the 19th and early 20th century were ideal or blameless. Of course not. But the publicness of the knowledge on which they relied was until recently our inheritance. It shaped all social policy up until around 20 years ago, perhaps sometimes still even to this day. Commercial corporations in the 19th century were only beginning to establish themselves as institutions. So at that time, they were the buyer, not the seller of this social knowledge. They depended on government to share it. The exception was the insurance industry which from early on acquired a special privilege to ask detailed questions of those they considered for insurance. But even there, as Dan Bauck brings out in a recent history of the American insurance industry, the relative simplicity of the statistical models then used made it possible for ordinary people who felt disadvantaged by insurers' calculations to challenge them. African Americans in America brought a case successfully to the Supreme Court to challenge how their racial status was treated by insurers when the premiums were calculated. Which brings out another feature of this older model of social knowledge. It's relative transparency. For all its faults, this older science proved a viable model of public knowledge for grounding societal reform. A model that actually challenged market forces and their effects on human lives. So what about today's emerging model of social knowledge? That based on pools of big data, processed by huge banks of parallel computers using so-called so machine learning. It's called machine learning, by the way, though as you may know, it often relies on some pretty dull work by human beings to refine the so-called training data from which those computers learn how to distinguish, say, a human face from a pumpkin. Now, this new way of generating and processing social knowledge is privately collected and funded, privately analyzed, privately debated most of the time inside the walls of corporations, and certainly mainly privately accountable, making it very hard to contest from the outside of corporation walls. In addition, because of the extreme complexity and massive repetition on which machine learning depends, this knowledge and its processes is largely opaque. It's not transparent. The remoteness of this new social knowledge from daily understandings of the world has been noted by journalists. For example, there's the this story of how in the early years of this decade, Uber executives 
when they held a party, used to treat the people there to what they called the God view of all Uber's cars tracked around the surrounding city, San Francisco. As part of the spectacle, they would show the locations of currently active passengers. Sometimes for fun, they removed passenger anonymity. But maybe Uber really were just playing. So let's take another US corporation, less well known, ShotSpotter, a data analytics company supporting the crime prevention sector. When ShotSpotter's CEO was challenged by an American judge to provide details of his proprietary algorithm on the basis of which the judge was going to decide on sentencing issues in court, he refused. It's like taking someone's Netflix subscription. And no, you don't do that. But then the knowledge that corporations like ShotSpotter are acquiring right across the social domain is not like someone's Netflix subscription. It is knowledge about our shared social world that must be publicly accountable, accessible, debatable, if that is, the social world is still the public world that for two centuries we have assumed it is. I've not yet mentioned another feature that a number of writers have found disturbing about algorithmic knowledge of the social world. That it's not based on talking to people, asking what they think, how they reflect, how they interpret the world they share, as even statistics were at their root. Instead, the goal of artificial intelligence, and therefore its huge attraction for corporations and governments that with access to the computing power and resources on which machine learning depends, AI's goal is the finding of proxies. Proxies discovered after countless layers of pattern seeking. Proxies which emerge as a good enough substitute for predicting when two things will be correlated. It's unclear what good enough means, which is why judges in legal systems, such as the American one, that are increasingly relying on private suppliers of algorithms, are asking what those products are based on, without, as we saw, always getting the answers. Now, as usual, it's the state's use of such algorithmic judgment that seems to attract most attention. For example, in the area of facial recognition, in China, facial recognition is becoming normal as uh, a government technique for national and local states. The goal is to have a database of the faces of all citizens by 2020. But it's also becoming a normal medium for economic transactions. You may have read that in Shanghai, you can pay for your Kentucky Fried Chicken simply by smiling at a camera. I guess smiling always helps. A Californian burger chain was recently reported to be introducing this in America. But facial recognition is just a very small part of how algorithmic ways of knowing are colonizing every domain of social interaction. So we can look at marketing, the fine-grained tuning of ads to your online presence, insurance, the car monitor on the dashboard that may give you lower premiums if you accept its presence in your car. Logistics, the detailed recorders that most truck drivers must now have in their trucks. And of course, management science itself. For example, the badge which MIT psychologist Sandy Pentland proposes introducing into every workplace to monitor how workers interact with each other to aid our understanding of the corporation's work culture. Now, these are all areas of everyday life that we had thought were part of the economy and the extraction of value. Maybe not so shocking, therefore. But there are other areas which expand much more radically the domain of data colonialism. First of all, the appliances and devices of everyday life, such as fridges and washing machines, are increasingly entangled with data relations through the Internet of Things. Marketers are already thinking far ahead to installing what they call product relationship management into all consumer goods to monitor their use continuously after purchase. Cars such as the Tesla can even make this seem cool. Second, in many countries, 
People are choosing, even competing, to self-track through devices such as Fitbit. In the marketing industry, external tracking devices above the skin are seen as just the first step. A fashion is developing for implanting computer chips beneath the skin as a sort of identity card that will speed up your progress through controlled environments. In Sweden, an advocate of such chips said, quotes, all of the wearables we wear today will be implantable in five to 10 years. And data colonialism is even expanding into the one domain we might have hoped would stand above the extraction of economic value, the institutions which regulate social life. In the US, there is growing debate about the use of algorithms in courts of law to which I'll return. Finally, in the UK, we learned recently that underfunded local government is using algorithms to assess if children are in danger and so need monitoring by social workers. In all these many ways, and I could go on, we are collaborating with the public-private surveillance partnership that, as Bruce Schneier said, spans the world. But from the perspective of marketers, as the leading producers of this new form of social knowledge, they have not lost, they have gained a social world to interact with, to influence. They imagine this world expanding, or should we say deepening, as ever more aspects of what we thought was just our internal life become somehow externalized so that they present a surface to be tracked. This appropriation of the stuff of our lives is already treated as banal in the marketing industry. Let me give you two examples. In a report on the wearable future, Price Waterhouse Coopers imagined a world where, quotes, brands could even tap body cues to tailor messages in real time, obviously. That world will provide marketing opportunities without limit. As they say, sensor revealing that you're thirsty. Here's a coupon for smart water. Meanwhile, in a consultant's report for the insurance industry called the Internet of Things Opportunity for Insurers, we learned that insurers could, quotes, use IoT enriched relationships to connect more holistically to customers and influence their behaviors. Now, I'm not for one moment saying that the authors of those reports, those who hope to build upon them, are evil colonialists who seek to do violence to human life deliberately. They would no doubt be horrified at the accusation. Maybe some are in the room. I'm sure they'd be horrified at this. But that's, I suggest, because they've already so internalized the ideology of data colonialism and the appropriations it requires. Let's not suppose, however, that this massive transformation of social knowledge will play out equally for everyone. As important research by Virginia Eubanks and others has shown, it is populations who are already vulnerable and poor that are most likely to be harmed by hidden data-driven judgments made against them by government departments, service suppliers, credit raters, insurers, and so on. By the same token, these same people are the least likely to be able to resist. It costs money to mount a legal claim. And when they look for work, the low paid work that they can get is likely to come with the compulsion to accept still more surveillance than is normal in higher status work. A social world then is emerging where vulnerability to forced acceptance of continuous surveillance is likely to become a leading dimension of inequality. Is there a risk that in this critique we are idealizing the past quietly? When, of course, populations were victimized, stereotyped, excluded silently from resources? I don't think so, provided we are precise about what is in danger of dropping out of our picture of the social world as this new form of social knowledge installs itself. And there are at least three answers to that question. First, and most directly, we are in danger of losing hold of those older models of social knowledge 
and the categories that they generated. For example, the idea of poverty as a socially caused phenomenon that can only be understood by attention to all the socioeconomic factors that are statistically correlated with it. As Marion Fourcard, an earlier speaker in this lecture series, wrote, older rationales for giving the poor more favorable terms because they were poor, that is socially disadvantaged in ways we understood, have now in America largely been replaced with the idea that the terms of credit ought to depend solely on one's prior credit-related behavior. That is, on the risks those people pose within commercial risk systems, as tracked, of course, by impersonal algorithms. Second, we risk losing hold of older forms of expertise and judgment that are not respected by the new model of social knowledge. So American legal theorists who studied algorithmic processes in local governments and the courts conclude that opaque algorithms risk, as they put it, hollowing out the decision-making capacity of public servants. Why? By creating a distance between their decisions and the evidence gathering on which those decisions still have to rely. Third, perhaps most dangerous of all, we risk all of us losing the habit of expecting that our knowledge of the world around us should be grounded in what people say, in how people, not machines, actually interpret the world. That is, it should be grounded in our voices. And because it is only that view of the social world that makes it rational to think democracy is worth striving for, we may lose touch with the value of democracy itself at least as an everyday reality, something we know. There's no accident, therefore, that in a country which is not a democracy, China, huge emphasis is being placed on gaining global leadership of artificial intelligence by 2030. So perhaps we should take seriously Zhu Bo, a member of China's Academy of Military Science, when he proposed in the Financial Times this September that, quotes, the road to prosperity no longer runs only through liberal democracy. It may also be no accident that there are links reported by some journalists between leading US figures associated with the exploitation of artificial intelligence, such as Peter Thiel, the founder of Palantir, and extreme right-wing thinkers who've abandoned all loyalty to democracy. There may be counterexamples too, of course, such as Estonia's much-cited vision for a digital society where it's the state that guarantees this management of personal data whose ownership, but perhaps not control, remains with the individual. But the Estonian vision only covers the individual's relations with the state. It doesn't cover the wider market for data, which is a feature of the corporate sector in Estonia, as in most other places. And finally, as an academic, I must acknowledge the social sciences' strange complicity today in these developments. I mean the new research from behavioral economics to cultural theory, which is often more interested in challenging, even mocking, the idea of a rational human subject than defending it. Not many steps from this to the frequent claim of marketers through artificial intelligence to know their customers better than they know themselves. So the message that I want to leave you with tonight is this, that the digital social world is being reconstructed all around us, not through an evil conspiracy, but through a practical combination on the ground of a new corporate rationality and the changes that this rationality encourages and often compels in how we live our daily lives. We are complicit in this transformation until we choose not to be. This rebuilding of the social world involves, as it were, a refilling of the tanks of social knowledge, filling them with another form of information that is less responsive to social, political, or even human inputs than we once thought social knowledge was. And none of this is accidental or just unfortunate. These developments are precisely the means through which the wider moves of data colonialism are sustained. 
a key transformation of our age that in time will fuel a new stage of capitalism whose full contours we cannot yet predict. And this transformation of social knowledge and the social world requires the hollowing out of something else. I mean the hollowing out of the space of the human subject, from whose interactions the social world is built, but who now to live in that world must increasingly submit to being tracked. At worst, through such tracking, we damage the space that underlies the very possibility of freedom. Assuming we still, following Hegel, understand freedom, as he put it, as the freedom to be with oneself in the other. When I am with Fitbit and its external infrastructures of data management, I am no longer fully with or alongside myself. Something else is in between. But there is one piece of hope, and this is we're still at an early stage of these profound changes within digital society. We can use our knowledge of the history of colonialism and capitalism and our awareness of the shape that data relations are already taking to question their inevitability, to challenge their necessity, and to imagine the possibility of still connecting with each other on other terms than these. The costs of connection can still, perhaps for a further decade at least, be renegotiated. The battle will be played out as much in China as in North America and Europe. In fact, and this may be the first cultural, economic, political battle where it's China, not the West, that sets the terms. In China, the vision of data-driven order that I've outlined for you tonight is already announced without apology, in the policy statements of the Chinese government. For example, on its social credit system, which is attracting much attention in the West. The Chinese government makes clear there that the goal of its artificial intelligence program is not to enhance freedom or better self-knowledge. It is, as it says, a market improvement of the social and economic order. This is not social order as we know it in the democracies of the West. It is not an order based on freedom, and yet it is based on broadly the same technological system of computer-based connection that we have been installing in the West. In fact, it's a more streamlined version of it. It's smarter. We're entering then a historic battle for the values of freedom on which we thought our democracies were built. In its early stages, this battle will be as much a battle for the imagination as for policy solutions or technological adjustments. The first question we must ask, therefore, is not how do we build different infrastructures for the economy, for social connection. The first question instead should be, is this the future for digital society that we had imagined and that we actually want? If not, then we must start to imagine a different future. And this is not easy. I agree with historian Yuval Harari, who wrote recently that opposing, opposing the ideology of dataism is, quotes, not only the greatest scientific challenge of the 21st century, but also the most urgent political and economic project. The challenge, in fact, is even greater, because the social transformation, as I brought out, that's going on that's driving it, is largely hidden. It risks, to quote one of my favorite German authors, W.G. Sebald, it risks becoming a silent catastrophe that occurs almost unperceived. So now is the time for our eyes to be wide open about what is going on with data, and that is why Ulysses and I have written our book, building on much great work by many other writers, it is indeed a time to work and think together to face these profound challenges. But time is short. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Nick, for this um, very strong lecture. Bleak at times in the outlook uh, with a small window of hope. 
Um, I would like to ask the question of the cost of connection and how it can be renegotiated in the next 10 years at the very end. This is a little cliffhanger here in our discussion after uh, audience particip participation and after what, um, the, what we're going to hear from Twitter and start with what I think um, might be just a controversial core, uh, actually, of your argument, of, of your lecture. It is already uh, in the title, and uh, it's the term colonialism uh, and neocolonialism. And you say explicitly, we do not understand it as a metaphor. Um, we understand it as something that denotes exactly the same thing. Then you go on to point out some differences between historical colonialism and what we are facing today. Um, actually, you're saying that what the conquistadores read out in the middle of the night in early 16th century um, in uh, Latin America, the requerimiento, equals the terms of service. Uh, the things we don't read, we don't understand um, in the internet. The terms of service come with a deal. At the end, they do come with a deal of consent, um, so to speak. And it's very hard to oppose that deal, yeah. to counter that deal. Would you still hold that it actually it is not a metaphor, or, or is it something like colonialism we have today? And how do we counter that deal that is so seductive to most of us? This is all night. No. Is this on? Ah, yes, good. Um, well, we use that analogy, and it's, it's an attempt to get our imaginations working. Um, we're not, the book does not depend on whether you believe that analogy exactly or not. There were differences. But it's, we find it a really striking similarity that the situation we all face in relation to terms and conditions that really emerged in the Cambridge Analytics scandal when people started looking at what they'd agreed to. The picture I put up of a phone with Facebook requires you to accept came when, as we were finishing the first version of our book, two weeks after the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Um, for some reason, I lost Facebook on my phone. And without thinking, because I hardly use Facebook, to be honest, um, without thinking, I said, oh, I must reinstall it. So when I tried to reinstall it, it gave me the choice uh, of what it would have to ex get from me for me to reinstall it. And stupidly, I pressed accept, but luckily I rem asked my wife to take a picture of my phone before I did so. And that's the picture I put up there. I'm not excluding myself from this complicity in any sense. Um, the reason we think there's a similarity is that the Spanish court, and it's important to remember this, in spite of the appalling violence that early colonialism involved, if you read the eyewitness accounts, it's beyond terrible what, what happened, was actually part of a much more complicated picture. The Spanish court wanted to grab the gold legally. There were fierce debates in the court of the Spanish king about how to do this legally. And that's why they drafted this document, the requirement, which would, just as we, as our data corporations ask us, because they want to do it legally, of course. Yeah, they could get it by consent. Yes, they operated with an implied consent. An implied consent. Mm -hmm. But of course, very often, since we know we never read those terms and conditions, they're in a language we don't understand, um, but we often don't even see them, so they might as well be in the middle of the night. Our data has already gone. We have already consented. So we think there's quite a precise analogy there. And that's why we suggest that although a few people have rightly said there are neo-colonial aspects to what goes on with data, such as Facebook's attempt to um, supply the internet on the cheap to 23 African countries and so on and so forth, that is neo-colonial. But it doesn't get to the core of what is newly colonial about what's going on with all our relations of data. And that's the distinction we want to make. Mm -hmm. India successfully fought against um, Facebook free basics, um, actually, so uh, there is an alternative to that. Uh, well, it did, and there was a strong civil society that mm -hmm. saw through the offer and saw it as an attempt to get market, increase market share, but also, of course, to get data um, from those Indian citizens, and so that was a very important battle. Let us stick to the notion of colonialism mm -hmm. just a little bit more. Um, I quote from... 
an article, actually, you wrote, uh, you wrote and then you said, in order to decolonize data colonialism, its underlying rationality must be attacked. You talk about epistemological decolonization. Of course, that's the big question. If we are living in a time of data colonialism, how do we decolonize it? Well, that's why I stressed at the end imagination, because we're talking about a, a very, very complicated very practical, very convenient in many ways, social and economic order, where we're all part of. Um, we, it, it's simply not practical to imagine that just by me going off Facebook tomorrow, I'm going to make any difference at all to that. If hundreds and hundreds of millions start doing that, that might begin to shake Facebook. They go to Instagram then. They go to Instagram, which is actually owned by Facebook. And in addition, there are all the other parts of the, what we call the social quantification sector. And then just to widen it a little bit more, we stress that we often focus on social media because that's the side of social quantification that we're most familiar with. Mm. But actually, that's only one small part of data colonialism. If you look at most businesses today and the way they think about logistics, the way they think about what it is to be a rational business, what it is to rant manage assets rationally, it always now involves the collection, the processing, and the implementation of decisions based on fine-grained data, which, depending on the class of the employees, very often involves bodily surveillance of those employees. So this is a live rationality right across management science, endlessly debated. Um, and it's important to see this goes very, very deep. So withdrawing from it is not straightforward. Uh, it's a collect massive collective project that will take 10, 20 years even to get clear some of the practical moves that could dismantle it. But the first step is the imagination. And the first step for the imagination to think about is the rationality that makes all of this seem somehow to make sense, to seem natural, to seem to be the way things have to be. Because it was not the way things had to be 30 or 40 years ago. And we need to hold on to that. Maybe we can come to the point where we think of who those agents will be who challenge this sort of rationality. Academia might be one uh, of those agents. But um, first, let us talk a little bit about labor and mm. resource. Um, from your lecture again, I quote, data colonialism is co in contrary appropriates life as a raw material, whether or not the data is the product of labor or labor-like um, conditions. Um, to me, that sounds um, pretty much like all of my friends are doing every day in journalism, in showbiz, in academia um, also, that they see social interaction as a form of labor, actually. This would not be surprising to most of the people I engage with in my everyday life. Is this a new quality then, so to speak? Is it something that is really brought about by those ancients you portrayed? There's is, an overlap is, here, uh, which is that it's certainly true that some of us are doing actual labor on platforms. Yeah. We are helping machine learning to work. When we read the capture signatures, we, are, we input data. That is, can be called labor. Maybe it should be called labor and paid accordingly. That's been an issue that a lot of the debate has focused on into recent years. And it's an important debate. Our argument is that that is only one part of the change. And if we focus on the part, we miss the whole. The whole is something much bigger, which is, first of all, as I said, all labor relations, whether or not they're to do with social media, the more familiar areas, are being datafied. They're having data relations incorporated into them, often involving the, the, the requirement to submit to be under surveillance of some sort. And that's really changing your life work conditions if you are particularly in a low paid job, a low status job. But the second thing that's going on that is very, very different, and it's subtly linked in and intertangled, life is complicated, but it is different, is the idea that whatever we're doing, even if we don't think it's work, even if no one thinks it work, is still living, and it still may generate useful data exhaust for corporations from which value can be generated. And this, uh, this is what we insist on in the book, is not something that corporations could have imagined 30, 40 years ago. Mm. Of course, they always had the goal of expanding across the whole terrain of 
social life. As Marx said, capitalism always expands. That remains true. But how it expands, the dimensions across which it can expand, that's where the change is. And if you like, just to put it in vivid terms, what we're saying is that it's almost as if we discovered some higher dimensions in which capitalism could also expand. We knew the basic three or four that are there right in front of us. It never occurred to us that our inner life, what we do when we think we're just reflecting, musing, or just thinking about whether we're running well, and so on and so forth, could also be a resource for capitalism. But that is what it now is. That's in a higher dimension of exploitation, potentially without limit, because the more we adapt to this, the more we expose new services for tracking. And that's why we insist this is genuinely a new moment where capitalism requires totally new potential unless we disagree, unless we start to stop this expansion. It may be on a higher level, but speaking of, Mar uh, of Marx, not of Marx, of Marx, I um, had to think of a Shakespeare quote he incorporated in Capital, Volume 1. He quoted a character, a comic character who is quite well known, I think, in Great Britain, not so much in Germany, of the play Much Ado About Nothing. Uh -huh. The character is called Dogberry. Oh, uh, right? And um, where he speaks of um, the commodity fetish, he quotes Shakespeare and this comic character who always confuses things uh, the wrong way around, like malappropriations, yeah. uh, so to speak. And he says, to be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but reading and writing comes by nature. Yeah. He says that in 1867, so uh, to speak. So this is like the commodity fetish turned around, that the gift of fortune, die Gabe der Umstände, um, of circumstance uh, is something else than reading or writing as nature. It's unmarked. So to be well favored today is the result of labor indeed. So can we say that Dogberry is proven right by datification? <laughs> well, Marx's idea that the world is actually upside down from the way it remains true. And uh, by the way, I know about Dogberry as a part I played when I was a student actor. <laughs> so I, it's, a, it's a great part. Marx um, said that the, the, with the commodity fetish, our confusion of the flow of life for things which intrinsically have a value somehow in a market, um, was crucial to the social order that is built on top of it. Um, and he argued that various things were fetishized in capitalism, um, such as uh, uh, rent was the fetish that somehow naturally comes from the land, or interest naturally comes from money. We're arguing in the book that there's a new fetish now, which is data itself. The idea that data is the natural, if you like, emission or product, output of life, which is something you can see in many management texts, uh, almost verbatim, you can see assumed in much management discourse. That is another fetish, the idea that data is the natural outcome of human life. It is actually not at all natural. Would you say that this new kind of fetish of data being the fetish actually explains for the shift we are witnessing of um, the public sphere and the private sphere? Because if the data actually is being fetishized and our life is the resource for this kind of data, as you uh, explained in your lecture, it would entail that our life is not private anymore, that it is a public good, so to speak, or a public resource. Ultimately, yes, unless we resist this massive set of changes that are going on. And that's why in the book, we have a whole chapter thinking about social knowledge. Mm. Because you can look at this all from the point of view of economic production, if you like. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. And there's so much great work that's been analyzing how data production works. And obviously, it's limits sometimes. It's not always successful and so on. Mm -hmm. But when we move to the other side of data, which is its role as social knowledge, as a, the stuff out of which we, know, we come to know the world we live together, then when you think about how that becomes normalized, built into the way we do live together on the basis of various assumptions, the way things are and so on, we expect our social media ratings to be taken into account when we go for a job and so on. Um, then you start to realize that 
there's a normalization built into the very foundations of social knowledge. It is very hard to shift once it's built in. And that's the transformation, the biggest transformation that's going on today. Because as I said, uniquely in human history, we're now saying that the stuff from which economic value is made is the stuff from which we know the world in which economic value is made. There's no gap between knowledge and value anymore. And this is something that even Marx could not have directly expected, although he might, if he were alive today, see it as a direct continuation mm -hmm. of his analysis. But it is an extraordinary new extension of where he was pointing us in his work in the 19th century. Because people are tracked and surveilled constantly, you said they lose the capacity to change over time. Maybe the next question leans into psychological territory a little bit. So surveillance, I mean, we are here speaking on uh, the grounds of the former GDR, uh, which was a different kind of surveillance state, not that there wasn't any surveillance in West Germany, um, God forbid, but uh, we know that it actually leads to change in behavior, to more coded behavior in the public sphere, to more hesitant um, behavior. Do we have that today? Because that would imply that people were actually aware that they lived in a constant state of potential surveillance, and I'm not sure if they actually are. Does it lead to changes in behavior already, would you say? Well, there may be, and I think we can observe it in the way young people use Facebook gradually as awareness of the fact that Facebook is a lot less private than initially people encouraged to think it was. I'm sure a certain caution, decorum, um, sort of social restraint has been built in. But that doesn't really get to the much bigger universe of surveillance that's going on every time we do almost anything online. It's impossible to integrate that in how we behave because it will require um, really acting on the basis that the corporation was watching us all the time. There's no way we could make sense of a life like that. Now, there is a reason why I put it that way, which is that I genuinely don't believe, and this is really like the normative, not the empirical side of our book. I genuinely don't believe that the direction we're going in now by installing as a business rationality the consistent tracking of every human activity and saying that's natural and saying as Kevin Kelly from California said, this is part of what we have to accept for technological momentum. I genuinely do not believe that is compatible with freedom. More importantly, it's not even compatible with the very basis of freedom. Uh, Hegel talked about this idea of the freedom to be with oneself in the other. What was extraordinary about Hegel and how he was so profoundly influential for Marx, but also the post-colonial theorists like Fanon and many others, is that he saw that freedom is relational. It's, he completely exploded the liberal model of freedom that's just me competing with you. Because the liberal model of freedom will not help us in any way deal with surveillance. Because we are being encouraged as consumers to trade in that sort of freedom mm -hmm. for convenience. The only type of freedom which can help us is the sort of Hegel, uh, freedom that Hegel expressed so brilliantly 200 years before any of this happened, which is relational freedom. The freedom to be oneself that I recognize in you and you recognize in me and that's why we value talking to each other, facing each other, having an encounter. That's what it means. That's the basis of its meaning. So when he says freedom is the freedom to be with oneself in the other, in the other is the complex social world we have to pass through as we live our lives. But the with oneself is the core. As he said, we always return to this circle of ourselves, which is always changing, but it's always our life that we're trying to push forward, become wiser, become less stupid, make less mistakes, become more humble, and so on and so forth. And it's that life that faces death, of course, at the end. Now, the idea, and Dave Eggers in his wonderful novel, The Circle, expresses this very, very well. The idea that we could give up that in exchange for convenience as he explains in the novel, is extremely violent, very absurd, strange, and it can cause a sort of madness in some of his characters. But of course, it's often disguised. We disguise this under many levels. So it's very hard to 
realize that this is actually what is at stake. It will take some time for this debate to develop, but I think this is what we are beginning to realize as marketers more and more expand their dominion over our lives, for example, through extended product relationship management, as I said in the lecture. This is the expectation of marketers, and we have to name it and be very explicit about it and ask ourselves, is this genuinely the life we want? And is, is that because it's compatible with freedom or is it because we don't care about freedom anymore? Maybe we have to redefine that notion of convenience uh, or freedom. And I think there's also, to put it kind of polemically, emerging markets that sort of cater to those kind of pockets. The question is just um, how exclusive they are. To give you an example, in Berlin, there's a very famous uh, uh, gay nightclub called Berghain and uh, like more and more nightclubs you cannot take your phone in there it's actually yeah. um, you cannot take any pictures or you're thrown out uh, immediately and uh, there's like at some concerts you get those little uh, bags where you have to put your yeah. phone in yeah. people actually pay for that kind of yeah. stuff yeah. to enjoy that kind of freedom um, there's a, like a big spa somewhere uh, north to Hauptbahnhof in, um, uh, in Berlin where there's kind of naked um, sauna landscape where there's no phones either. People pay a lot of money to get in there <laughs> and to lock their phones yeah. into little lockers. But as you, you actually hit the nail on the head, as mm -hmm. we say in England, people have paid for it mm -hmm. a lot. And that's why I brought out the issue of inequality. That, you know, if you, to live, have to do three or four jobs, then you have to accept the terms and conditions of those jobs. Those jobs probably because there are three or four of them, involve coordinating as you move around space. You must have your phone on, you must be connectable at all times, you must submit to any platforms that require your data to track your performance and so on. The, we are not going to get to a world where all of us are feeling the sort of pain and sense of loss of freedom that I emphasize in the argument, because there will be winners in this game. There will be those who have the power to win, to protect themselves more, who as CEOs of companies and so on will make sure that they are not tracked every moment of every day. Sure. I think if we take Amazon, we know that what goes on on the Amazon warehouse uh, where they find the books, and I do use Amazon, I don't deny it, they find the books, they have, they have something called voice picking. So the employees in their trolleys, in their, their, their vehicles, have to follow very precise instructions through their headphones, telling them to move a little to the left, a little to the right, and so on, all day. That's all they do. Now, I don't believe that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, has to negotiate how he moves around his ballroom in the same way. I don't believe it. I'm sure he has a lot more freedom as to his discretion. <laughs> and that brings out, this is a fundamental new dimension of inequality exposure to surveillance. And that may help us not see that it's still driven by a general problem. The last question, before we open it up to the audience, actually um, deals with equality, or rather inequality. Again, from your lecture, um, you said it is knowledge about our shared social world that must be publicly accountable, accessible, debatable, if, that is, the social world is still the public world that for two centuries we have assumed it is. Now, my question would be, has it really been that public uh, all the time, uh, like we assume? Because the exclusion government pr reproduces, for example, uh, still, that is in Germany at least, is becoming apparent again in a lot of German sociology at least, the lack of what they call responsivity towards the lower social stratum has been constant in the last up to four decades. So even before neoliberalism hit actually Germany, quite a few German sociologists um, write down that vein. Do we, know, do we need more equal government well, uh, before we talk about equality or inequality of the private sector? Well, I'll come back to that in a minute, but the first thing I want to stress is that, as I said, and we're not idealizing the 19th century and, and 20th century. You said that. They yeah. were clearly not perfect. There, in fact, there were desert catastrophes. This sort of social knowledge was abused to the most terrible ends, as we all know. However, the point we're making is that if you look back historically, and we're basing that on a lot of studies on the 19th and 20th century, and we're not historians, they were, this was in principle publicly driven knowledge, in principle, with abuses and so on, like everything. We're now 
building a world where the knowledge that enables us to recognize it as social is in principle private, privately owned, privately gathered, privately put to use, in principle mainly privately accountable, unless we somehow through legal cases force it open. That's a very big shift. Um, and it's a shift that I think directly relates to the point you were making. Um, what sort of government will we have? Well, it's a strange thing to get our heads around, but it's, if you go up to around the late 1980s, uh, private corporations used to buy statistics off government, particularly in America, because they didn't have the data gathering capacity. With credit cards and all the things that came in at that point, they gradually acquired a data gathering capacity that far exceeds now what a government can do. Which is why in Britain, three or four years ago, the government even considered abandoning its national census, two centuries old, because it could get the information cheaper and more regularly from the market. Now, then you may say that's just a market deal, and some neoliberal people would say that. But the problem is where a government delegates the responsibility of knowing the world that it's there to govern to private corporations, you have a very different notion of democratic government. And you also have a very different social world, which I think will not necessarily be compatible with the rationale of democracy, which is that all of us deserve voices because we're normally listened to and therefore we should be listened to in the political realm. What if we get used to no longer being listened to when the world that we know is described back to us? Then we don't even have a rationale for democracy anymore. That's what worries me. Or oh, we could talk a whole evening about um, the history of the censuses in Germany that was highly controversial uh, I know, in the I know. 80s. Germany is um, a special case on the <laughs> census. Special I mean, European case, yes. But now it is high time to uh, open up this discussion to you. There's two microphones in the back. Please raise your hand and I'll try to distribute the microphones as good as I can from up here. I saw a hand on this side. Please, the gentleman with the glasses. Can you just stand up so the microphone sees you, so to speak? Thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, as you have amply demonstrated, uh, the worlds of data is deeply entrenched and with a lot of emergent properties, uh, probably not uh, equal in terms of colonialism. So I'm wondering, again, as the discussant, I'm wondering the usage of the term colonialism here. Is it not calling uh, colonialism like Transterritorial feudalism, or something like that, because the the the, the lives of data, the the way it is uh, transacted, it is the way it is generated, the way it is, uh, uh, the emergent properties of it are far far deeper than the uh, the the processes of colonialism. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it's obviously a very important question, and we thought very hard about the use of the word colonialism. And let me stress, although. I'm a white English man from London who you might think is really not qualified to talk about colonialism, having been descendants of those responsible for a lot of it. Um, my co-writer is Mexican, and this is very much our joint work. This is our joint position, that, that, that we need the word colonialism to understand what's going on. And we need to come together, if you like. And it's been a wonderful experience writing the book with Ulysses because we started from very different histories of what colonialism actually means to us, but we've evolved a common position through writing, which is absolutely our common position. And that's, for me personally, very important. But why do we use the word colonialism? Could we use the word feudalism? Quite a few people have used the word feudalism. I was tempted by that term myself at a very early stage. Um, I don't think it's like feudalism. Feudalism, after all, involved um, social responsibilities for the feudal lord. Um, it was a very abusive and unequal world, but nonetheless, the other side of the taking of resource, the one-tenth in Britain over the corn, was the responsibility to somehow maintain the village and do various things. There was a sense of uh, responsibility, however unequal that was. So it's not obviously accurate to say it's feudalist, although it's certainly a big uh, grab of territory that feudalism was. 
The reason why we say it's colonial, it's because the only period in history when we can look back and think about when were the f economic fundamentals of the world economy changed. And they were changed around 1500 when corporations, they weren't even corporations at that state, they tended to be kingdoms in Spain, Portugal, Britain, Holland, and so on, began to imagine an extraordinary possibility that they could literally appropriate the whole of the world's resources. That was, a, a, put it crudely, a game changer, a completely different way of thinking about what the economy was, that the world was there for the taking, however much violence it took. And we are arguing that this is a fundamental change in what capitalism, which of course is already now fully established, can do. That it can appropriate any form of life in any detailed form it takes and see that as a source. And that is such a fundamental change, we think only the word colonialism gets to, if you like, this game-changing quality. But there's the additional hook that, as we know, although some histories of capitalism, sometimes Marx has been criticized for this, ignore it, capitalism came out of colonialism. It came out of the profits, the resources of colonialism. So if we, st we need to, and this is where the colonialism comes in. Not only does it give us a more accurate take on what capitalism still is, that it emerged from colonialism, but it gives us this broader time scale. This time scale of the past 500 years to think about. And so we're invited everyone to think, could we be at the beginning of a new 500 year time cycle? With a new capitalism developing, maybe things will accelerate now because we already have capitalism in the next half century which will be very differently organized from anything we imagine now because every one of us will be plugged in as a source for capital. Work will be totally differently organized. Corporations will be differently organized. Services will be differently organized and so on. None of us can predict that yet. But it's that sort of act of the imagination we want to encourage because we believe that the change is that fundamental. There's, uh, yeah, please, please stand up. Right in the middle, maybe fourth row, fifth row. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you for this wonderfully incisive work that you're doing. And listening to you, you uh, managed to demonstrate and dramatize the way that knowledge is socially, um, has social efficacy. The work that knowledge does in, in fusing and consolidating social orders. And then you point to the beginning of the colonial story, which is also the beginning of the Renaissance and the kinds of knowledge systems that do scientific uh, forms of knowledge generation develop in tandem with. Yeah. And I fear that amongst the ideologies that you identify, there is ideology built into the knowledge that we would hope to be able to have recourse to now, which is reliant on factual, neutral, falsifiable systems of knowledge. And those are not forms of understanding epistemology that reveal their social efficacy at all. They obscure them. And the, so, I, so to put this into question, how would you frame the possibilities for revalorizing subjectivity in ways that still can have scientific uh, knowledge producing validity? You mean each of us revalorizing our subjectivity or you mean at a more general level? Re re revitalizing subjectivity in as part of the social order, as part, subjectivity is not just expressed in individual activity, but in collective yeah. activity or in plural yes. activity. Yes. Of, of all kinds of different gradations. And you mean that as the beginnings of some form of resistance mm. to what's going on, obviously. Yeah, that's a very important point, and that's why I stressed earlier that, um, in case it sounded otherwise, that the type of freedom we're saying is a threat isn't um, the purely individual freedom. Um, my freedom to make choices in the market to know what 
bag of crisps I buy or not. I'm not sure I even care who, who knows why I buy what bags of crisps I buy. It's not really very important. I'm, but I am concerned about an attempt to grab my whole subjectivity, of which that's just an extremely small part. And the reason we mention Hegel, but also there are Latin American thinkers one can draw on as well. There's a Mexican philosopher called Enrique Dussel who made a similar point to Hegel. Um, even though he developed his philosophy against the West, uh, in the face of Western domination, he developed the idea of the natural substance of the person, which has to be protected at all costs against external power. Um, and that is on the basis that this is not something I just have on my own. I have it, I, I acquire it in a social world, in a world that respects me, that cares for me, that enables me to trust others just as they can trust me. I gradually acquire that possibility of feeling that I have a certain freedom that is, I respect in others just as they respect in me. It's relational from the start. So we have to start from that, and that leads to an important practical point, um, maybe two, which is that this struggle to challenge this uh, rationality which undermines subjectivity as we've known it, has to be a collective battle. It has to be each of us saying these conditions are intolerable. We need to work together to help each other reduce our dependence. That's going to be hard. We have to work together on this. It cannot work as an individual battle. So we're strongly against those people who say, well, each of us should now just withdraw from Facebook and that will solve it exercise our market freedoms. That simply misses the point that this is a struggle for a different type of collective life, a different way of being connected to each other. Um, the other point that it raises is this question about rationality, which you think um, uh, Toby was mentioning. For us, um, the final moment when we got the whole picture of our argument in view was when we rediscovered a wonderful essay by um, a Peruvian sociologist called Anibal Quijano, who wrote an essay about uh, nearly 30 years ago called Modernity Slash Rationality. And in that essay, he goes through what you just mentioned, the, the development of the Enlightenment and its entanglement one way or the other. And I would, not, I would never crudely reduce the Enlightenment to colonialism or economic forces. That, that's obviously ridiculous. But there was an entanglement between the Enlightenment and the extraordinary expansion of wealth through colonialism at the same time. Francis Bacon, one of the writers for the Enlightenment, was also a theorist of colonialism. However, if we follow through that history to where we are now, he argues the key thing we need to resist, the core, is a certain idea of rationality. There's nothing wrong with rationality. <laughs> Human beings have a right to try and live their lives better, to make more sense of it, to be more rational, to encourage others to be more rational. Of course, rationality, being more rational is fine. But the idea that one part of the world, as it were, owns the model of rationality, the definition of what can count as rational, that is the violence. And that we know that was a very integral part of certain forms of science and obviously colonialism. And when we discovered this, we realized this is the core of the big data, of datarism. The idea that only by gathering data in this way, on these terms, and aggregating it this way, in these places, can we have any hope of knowing human beings. That is an extraordinary claim, and we have to challenge that at its core, just as we've challenged the historical versions of that. But this is a living presence right now. These are claims being made right now by the World Economic Forum, UNDP, the consultants, and so on. These are the language that they're talking in. And if we do not expose that as a colonial claim at this point, then we have no hope of challenging this whole shift in the nature of knowledge. We have to learn from what we already know about colonialism. If we don't, we are blind in facing this challenge. And we are not blind, we have the knowledge. So I thank you for that point. 
again, a notion of complicity in there uh, <laughs> that resurfaces. We take one more question before we go to Twitter. I know there's many questions. It's kind of hard to handle right now, but you'll get your turn, I hope. There's a gentleman in the short. red sweater <laughs> and the headphones on right there who raised his hand early on. And after that, we'll ask what's on. on ja, Twitter. schönen guten Abend. My name is Georg von Borovicini, Piraten. Ich muss es leider auf Deutsch sagen. Ich hoffe, der Kollege, der Vortragende, bekommt es übertragen. So, ich warte ja. Gut, äh, mir fehlen bei Ihrer Analyse einige Punkte. Sie haben sehr viele Gefahren aufgezeigt, wobei ich sagen muss, ein Teil ja, ich stimme Ihnen vielfach zu, aber ich sage auch, sehr vieles können wir selber direkt ändern. Es ist die Frage, ob ich Facebook mit Goldnuggets bezahle oder mit abgegriffenen Kupferstückchen. Das entscheide ich. Dann ist es so, was mir gefehlt hat, ist tatsächlich der Einfluss, die Möglichkeit, und die gibt es jetzt seit 33 Jahren, der Zivilgesellschaft, CCC, beobachtet das sehr genau, arbeitet sehr präzise dagegen. Es gibt sehr viele Menschen, die äh, Nutzungsbedingungen durchgucken und sagen, hier stimmt was nicht, hier stimmt was nicht, hier stimmt da was nicht. Es gibt die Bewegung, und die ist dringend, des Open Datas. Da habe ich so die Frage an Sie. Sie schreiben ein Buch zusammen mit einem Freund und sagen, Sie benutzen sehr, sehr viele andere Quellen. Wie viel sind davon eigentlich Open Data oder müssten es sein, weil wir alle hier bzw. weltweit diese Arbeiten mit unseren Geldern, unseren Steuern bezahlt haben. Und was mir dringend, dringend fehlt, wären natürlich politische Antworten. Wenn Sie China, das, ich sage mal, deutlich schlechte Beispiel vortragen, ja, aber was mache ich dann hier in Deutschland, was mache ich dann hier in Europa politisch, was fordere ich, um diesem Wettlauf zwischen Hase und Igel, die einen wollen, mein Gold, ich will, dass, dass sie das zurückgeben. Wir müssen was, uns auf eine Frage beschränken. Also sie was bitte. wollen ja? wir politisch geändert haben, damit die Gefahren nicht auftreten? Maybe we cannot answer all of the questions or comments. Thank but you very much. Thank you very much for that. There's a very important series of points you're making. And of course, in the book, I wasn't emphasizing it in the lecture. I was trying to give you a vision of a general direction of travel. If I'd had another hour, we could have got into practicalities. There are things that people are trying to do. We are in the beginnings of what Polanyi called a counter-movement. People are beginning to sense something is wrong. Things need to be changed. Yes, uh, corporations such as Facebook are facing some major challenges now in terms of their public policy, their involvement in the public world. That needs to continue, of course. I don't deny that for a moment. The issues around open data are also very important. I know there are proposals in Germany for Facebook to release some of its data for use by smaller corporations. That may be a contribution in some way. Um, our point, though, and this is why we do put it in more dramatic terms, is that none of those proposals, though they may have some benefits, gets to the core issue of the collection of data, um, which is fundamental to the question of freedom as we see it. And also, they don't deal with the fact that this is a very large-scale system. Facebook is just one player, however powerful within it. So, we are saying in the book, not that we neglect the practical responses, they will become increasingly important. But we're saying that when we're facing a whole social order that is being built partly through our own activities, the starting point cannot be practical proposals. Because none of us, if we're honest, knows how to change this yet. We do not. And therefore, the best starting point is to imagine 
use our imagination to think and use historical knowledge to think about whether this is the direction we want to go into, if not, to imagine how that world might be different and then together to start to think how we might build ways of connecting with each other differently. That will involve some of the measures you're talking about, but it may involve very other thing, different things as well. And the position of governments is very, very complicated um, because as I said, governments are now mainly the buyers of this data, not the sellers. Their bargaining power has been reversed compared with two centuries ago. And that's a very dramatic change in the relation between corporations and government. So although, of course, I have hopes that law can change things, I think the GDPR was a fundamental intervention in terms of challenging the market rationality coming from the United States in particular. It's enormously important politically and symbolically um, I still have reservations as to how much it can, can change because it, it does not change the terms on which we give consent most of the time to the collection of data. It's changed the debate, but it may not yet have changed what we're doing every day. And that's what we have to focus on for the long term. There's a whole bunch of questions here in the audience, but I hear there's not that much going on uh, on Twitter tonight. Oh. One question, so let's hear it. We need a microphone up here. First row. Thank you. So, so far there's just one question on Twitter. How can we remediate our social data relations or our platforms and the individual? Should we look at imposing a fiduciary duty on platforms? Well, that's a proposal that's been made in the United States, and I should explain what it means because I'm, I don't know how far the concept of fiduciary duty translates into German law. I, I just don't know. Um, in American and British law, the idea of fiduciary duty is um, the sort of special um, responsibility that we have in certain contractual relations. Strangely enough, when you enter into a contract in English law with an insurer, you are under a special obligation to tell the truth because they are insuring your life or whatever. They're taking the risk on your life. And this came out of two or three centuries ago. So it's a very special duty and some American lawyers think this could be a basis of changing the way we think about corporations. I think it could be a good legal start because I think, first of all, we have to go beyond the idea that um, Facebook and so on are just corporations doing what they have a right to do in the market. They are providing infrastructures for social life. They are claiming exactly to provide the basis of social life. That must come with some notion of special responsibility. So I think there's something in that as part of changing the whole legal environment and the way we think about these corporations while they still continue to exist. So I think that's an important point. And I would stress that in, in the United States, there's a really ex some excellent debate, which is increasingly taking into account the GDPR. That's a big shift in the past year to two years, um, that the American debate, which tended to be very closed off from the European debate, has increasingly started to take into account the symbolic importance of GDPR interrupting markets and this is a that's why the GDPR was so important and that's why law is very important but under these special conditions it may not be the only answer after all there were laws regulating the markets in the 19th century which made capitalism less cruel but it didn't by any means end all the problems so but the GD PR is part of the renegotiation you were talking about. Yes, I think so. Partly because symbolically it, it says in the first sentence of the GDPR that the collection of personal data raises fundamental questions of human rights. In other words, it's not just a question of corporations doing what they can in the market. That's a fundamental principle. I'm just a bit more skeptical about whether all its measures will be sufficient hmm. to stop us giving consent when we don't really plan to. That's a very difficult problem, but it's the start of a massive change, uh, in the law at least. There's a lady in the back who wanted to ask a question for a long time, so please go ahead. So you'll have the, the headphones. 
Ich wollte Einen nur Moment warten kurz, bis er die Kopfhörer auf hat. So, bitte. Okay. Ja? Ich wollte wegen dieser ähm, Vergleich äh, nur was fragen. Sie haben jetzt die Kolonisierung von Lateinamerika äh, mit, äh, mit dieser aktuellen Kolonisierung verglichen. Ich bin selber auch aus Lateinamerika und ich wollte mal wissen, äh, weil Sie haben gesagt, dass die, die Spanier haben Sie sich da eine Gesetzgebung einfach gegeben, um dieses Gold einfach zu stehlen, offiziell oder legal. Aber eigentlich war diese Kolonisierung auch ein Unternehmen. Es war nicht nur äh, das Gold das, das Wichtigste, sondern es waren auch die Menschen oder überhaupt äh, eigentlich äh, das Landstück und nicht die Menschen. Und es war vor allem eigentlich ein Unternehmen der Vernichtung. Und das ist das Wichtigste eigentlich von der Geschichte und nicht nur das Gold. Das Gold war, war wichtig, aber das Wichtigste in der Geschichte ist eigentlich diese Vernichtung. Wenn Sie diesen Vergleich machen, äh, glauben Sie auch, dass es vielleicht jetzt äh, für diese Zukunft, können wir auch erwarten, dass es auch eine Vernichtung wird, weil es war eine legale Vernichtung. Diese Gesetzgebung wurde auch dafür gegeben, nicht nur um Gold zu stellen, sondern auch um Menschen zu vernichten. Danke. This is something we thought about a lot because obviously it will be very important if uh, the transformations we're talking about could not ever involve some of the violence that clearly was core to uh, the appropriation of resources in historic colonialism. And we're very careful never to pretend um, that there's actual violence going on at the moment. We would never make such a silly claim. But what we do say um, is that in the long run, and this is the argument about the social world, in the long run, raise, ways of living, ways of recognizing each other in the social world, ways of listening to voices on the basis they matter as opposed to the current big data rule, which is to say voices do not matter. They don't count. They don't add into useful data. Um, that's what will be exterminated. And we do use that word in the book because it's very serious. When a way of thinking about the human world ends, it ends. And we are just beginning down a road where that could happen. That's not the same as physical violence, but it may be as drastic a result uh, in, the, in the long run. Um, and I think we have to take that seriously, but of course we put that quite cautiously in the, in the book. Um, but the point I made about um, the Spaniards and what they wanted to do was simply to get the point, across the point that they had very complicated uh, goals. Some people wanted colonialism to be legal. There were long debates in the Spanish court about how it could be made legal. Others were entirely in favor of grabbing the resources without the legal cover and so on. It was a complicated reality, just as today is a complicated reality. But the actual reality in the long run was the appropriation of resource. So we shouldn't confuse today's complexity and the wonderful mission of Facebook and so on, which sometimes is humanizing, uh, inspirational, you could sometimes, some of the words used, we should not confuse that with the reality of the grabbing of data. That was the only point I was making. Inevitably, it's a very complicated uh, comparison. I am told we're running late, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, I have to come to the very last questions. There is something to eat outside, there's drinks outside. Uh, we can um, further discuss those uh, things outside. I'm trying to rephrase my last question. I was announcing uh, a little bit you know, about the renegotiation and I'd like to quote really quickly uh, uh, Marion Fourcat uh, again, which, uh, who was part of this series. You quote her by saying, all the rationales for giving the poor more favorable terms because they were poor that is socially disadvantaged, have now in the USA largely been replaced with the idea that the terms of credit ought to depend solely on one's prior credit-related behavior. That is, the risks those people pose within commercial risk systems as tracked in personal algorithms. There it goes again, the question of inequality and how it's changing, how it's actually not natural, but how it's evolving under different uh, economic systems, so to speak, or even new levels, as you call them. Now, 
The question is, isn't that something that actually could be fixed uh, by legislation? The bias uh, in these algorithms, uh, which we talked about a lot in this series, um, that eradicates the social factors built in, which in the end means that um, technology, sociology, philosophy, philosophy, and the humanities should work much more closely together, which is, I think, something uh, uh, the Institute for Internet and Society, which is co-hosting this year, is, is precisely doing, or is trying to do. Is it not happening enough? Should we do that more? Is there a kernel for change right there? I think that's a very good point. The, 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 as I said, it just hinted at it, Polanyi said, explained that the transformation of the 19th and 20th century was a double movement. First, there was the change of society so that capitalism could work within it. Then there was the counter movement, legislation in factories and schools and so on and so forth, against child labor and so on. It's quite possible we will begin to see some fundamental legislative challenges that go to the core of how data be collected. Maybe GDPR is the beginning of that, laying down some fundamental first principles on a general scale, but not getting to the question of how the data is used, the sort of judgments that can be made. Yes, this is exactly what we need to be talking about. I believe this is a, a, a challenge right across disciplines. Um, we can't stay in our disciplinary silos in thinking about this. We're talking about the transformation of society. Uh, communication scholars need to work with lawyers, um, political theorists, economists, um, sociologists to work and so on to try and develop agendas for change and legal reform. This is beginning to happen to some degree in the States, United States, with the involvement of critical data scholars who are doing remarkable work, often face, taking high risk to challenge corporations. We are just at the beginning, I believe, but it's a very exciting time. We're at the beginning of this counter movement, and I passionately believe that academics have a responsibility to speak up and make clear what it is that they find so troubling about the world that is being built around and through us. Thank you very much for this lecture. You got a little uh, lost, but you made it in time. You didn't trust Google Maps enough, I think. But uh, <laughs> no. then you, you made it like right on point. We ran a little late, but um, I ascribe this to the topic uh, that is so hot and troubling uh, at the same time. Thank you for bearing with us uh, for so long. As I said, let's have a drink outside. There's something to eat. Thank you, Nick Coldry. Thanks to you. See you in December. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>